start with the call to worship, and uh, the music group will come up. Call to worship is in Psalm 9, 9 and 10. The Lord is a stronghold to the oppressed, and a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know his, your name put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I would just open in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this morning and time together um, to worship you, Lord, and I just pray that um, you would find our time of worship a blessing. Amen. Break the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name.
For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you, are, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to those you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found on in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who justifies freely. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die, in our, die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. <coughs> we're doing things in the wrong order today. Thank you. There is also an offering. You guys have come forward and looks like cow has a lot. <laughs> So much, Mark, for uh, leading the, uh, the worship. You did a great job. Thanks for your praying. I appreciate all the elders, deacons at this church. Before I start, I'd like to make a public apology, and that's to the ladies of the treasure chest. I think that I um, spoke a little bit harshly, a little too harshly, without making details. I'd just like you to know that I'm sorry for, honestly sorry, for. Uh, being too harsh. I think that was wrong of me. I think, yeah, there was maybe some pride in there. And I thank you for a bit of grace to learn a bit more about how to be a pastor. It is a little overwhelming uh, uh, for me, I'll say that. But uh, if you would accept that apology. Um, the passage today is a difficult passage, really difficult. And it's been very challenging for me because it tackles some very difficult subjects for us as believers in Christ. Uh, pride, pride is a, it's a bad, bad thing. And it, uh, it's just part of what this uh, passage is talking about is humility and being willing to submit, to bring yourself under authority. And uh, it's been difficult and I don't know how exactly to do this, but I'll try my best. So um, I titled it Following Jesus, Called to Submit and to Suffer. <coughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor and theologian. 
Maybe you've heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he's, a, he's a hero of mine, really. I, I think the world of him. Uh, he was part of an attempt to assassinate Adolf Hitler. And, uh, but he was also an astounding theologian. And he wrestled greatly with this decision that he had to make a stand because it was important. At Flossenburg concentration camp, he was tried by a hastily rigged court and condemned to death. Early the next morning, Bonhoeffer was executed. He was hanged until dead, along with co-conspirators. Before this, he written to his trusted friend, his name Eberhard Bethke. I hope I pronounced that right. And after the failed assassination attempt, he wrote this. How should one become arrogant over successes or shaken by one's failures? When one shares in God's suffering in the life of this world, you understand what I mean, even when I put it so briefly. I am grateful that I have been allowed this insight, and I know that it is only on the path that I have finally taken that I was able to learn this. So I am thinking gratefully and with peace of mind about the past as well as present things. May God lead us kindly through these times, but above all, may God lead us to himself. In the middle of World War II under Nazi Germany, he wrote those things as he faced execution. His final recorded words before his hanging were this, this is the end, for me, the beginning of life. Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew what it was to follow the footsteps of Christ, to follow towards suffering, towards sacrifice. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. I pray that your word would ring true. I pray that you would use the words that are spoken here and that they would be a blessing to the people, these dear people who believe in you, Lord. I pray that nothing I say would cause anyone to stumble, far be it from that, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit would intercede and that you would guide us, guide us as a people, and help us to learn from this text. In Jesus' name, amen. The central verse in this passage is 1 Peter 2.21. For to this you were called. For to this you were called. You were called to this. You were called to something much higher, much greater than yourself and also more difficult and more, more, of a, more of a hardship than you can imagine. Being called here is to submit and also being called to suffer unjustly. This is a tall, tall order, but it's part of the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ whom we follow. His mission was to submit himself to suffer and to die. And so as we take this walk following him, we move further and further into the will of God for us. The main points in this sermon are, submit to the Lord in your behavior. Submit to government out of respect for God's name. Submit to those over you, whether at work or at church. And then lastly, Christ submitted himself for your sake. Main point number one, submit to the Lord in your behavior. 1 Peter 2.12, this verse really captures this. Keeping your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Honorable. We've seen previously it's talking about within the heart, about things that we need to get rid of and throw off, malice or deceit and those sorts of things. But now we're seeing how those passions bear fruit. 
Throw off those sinful passions. Why? Because there's conduct behind them. There's things that come out of your life as you do those things. The sins that we're talking about are not just inward, they have outward expression. And these result in things that we say and things that we, we do. This bad conduct. And so that's why the two are paired together. Throw them off, resist sinful passions, have good conduct. Conduct before a watching world. It's talking about the kind of people that the Lord wants you to be. It's talking about how we represent the Lord. The Christian life is more than just giving up sinful behavior. Otherwise, the verse wouldn't be here. It's more than that. It's more than just, well, don't do this and don't do that. No, it's turn to the good. As you turn and you repent, there's a turning from one thing and finding the other. You find the Lord and his righteousness. We must turn to what is right. Every believer has received the Holy Spirit. And this is an important gift. Without it, I don't think we could really accomplish much that is good and right. But we have been given this gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're told that the Spirit wars within. He tries to drive down the works of the flesh, our sinful passions which try to rise up. And so we must walk in the Spirit of God. We see here in 1 Peter 2.11 that this warring is actually warring against our very own soul. These things would destroy us. But God does not want this. He wants us to become people for Him. Your behavior is important to God. Your behavior reflects the Lord. It's important in more ways than one. Let me point this out. Firstly, when we walk in the Holy Spirit and not in our own nature, this is pleasing to God. Very pleasing. Secondly, having good conduct and living apart from these sinful passions is a testimony to the watching world. It's a testimony. And thirdly, doing good and living for Christ will, as the Bible says here, silence the mouths of fools. Yes, it is God's will to make some people shut up. It says here, and Jesus tells us, that we should understand that when we confess him, there'll be some reviling coming against you. There will. And we shouldn't be shocked by it, and we shouldn't shy away from confessing him because of that. He's saying that when you suffer that reviling, that is a gracious thing in his sight. It's not missed by God. He doesn't miss that. And remember, Jesus said this, if the world hates you, remember, know it, that they hated me before they hated you. If you come against that kind of hatred, you won't always. But if you do, for his name's sake, rejoice. Rejoice. One day, God will use your good works to shut their mouths. And that's what it says. Your good works of submitting to the Lord will bring some reviling sometimes. They'll look at you and they'll think, oh, what a do-gooder. Oh, Christians are all just, yeah. They'll have some opinion, they'll have some bad things to say. But just understand this, the Lord doesn't miss that. Scripture tells us it's actually the will of God for you to have that in your life. You want to know what God's will is? His will is that you would submit and that you would suffer. It's hard to take. And in the end, it says that by turning from evil and doing what is good, that in the day that he appears, they will glorify God because of what you did by faith. Because of what you did by faith, they will glorify God on that last day. Their mouths will be shut. So, let's glorify God in our behavior. These people are fools. That's what the Bible says of them. They are foolish and ignorant. This is what it says in the text. 
Foolish because they do not turn and receive the free gift of salvation being offered to them. Foolish. Foolish because they believe in their heart there is no God. Yes, but also ignorant. Ignorant of the truth. They don't know. And so you should have some pity for them because they don't know the Lord. They don't know, and there's a horrible end for them. Continue in the good, in spite of the reviling. Sometimes we may be tempted to think it's not worth it. And I'd like to point out to us the great example that we have of Christian martyrs. Sometimes we forget. And there are people martyred today for their faith as well. Did you know in Roman times, Christians were put to death in the arena, the Roman arena? It's true. This isn't written by Christians, it was written by Romans. They would sew animal skins on them, put them in the arena, and watch them torn to death by lions and other animals. Pretty bad stuff. One of the Caesars, several of them were horrifying in what they did to Christians. Nero, Domitian. Domitian used to put Christians on spikes and hang them up on his poles and then light them on fire for his garden parties. Are we willing to do that? Do we understand the call, the high calling? We have here? Do we understand what could happen? God will give you that grace in that day if you're called to do that. But when you're tempted to not be reviled for his name, don't. Know that there's grace for you there. Stand for him. Main point number two. Submit to government out of respect for God's name. 1 Peter 2.13 says, Be subject to every human institution. And it, the wording in the Greek is everything. All human institutions. Submit to them. We see this, that the Bible describes believers here, in, before we hear this call to follow and submit, we see that we are a royal priesthood, and we hear that we are living stones. And we think to ourselves, goodness me, this is too high of a calling for me. This is so much farther beyond what I, I signed up for. I don't know about this. The Lord has described this is what Christians have already become. He says this is what you are in his eyes. It says you are a holy nation. In light of this, we are told to throw off sinful ways. And that as his disciples are not of this world, John 17, 16. These are amazing words, truly amazing words. They're much higher than us. It's much higher than we could imagine. It's a high calling. And this is what the Lord is saying here. But take heart. He's growing you like a living stone. He wants to make you into one who is able to do that. You see, his plan is so much higher than ours or what we could imagine. His thoughts are higher. His ways are higher than ours. Imagine for yourself when you were a child and you tried on your parents' shoes. Or maybe when you were a, a little girl, you, the ladies here remember trying on your mom's high heels. Or as a little boy, you put on your father's uh, leather dress shoes or something. And you would be lost in those shoes, swimming in them. You put both feet in one. And you think to yourself, will my feet ever fit into these? The answer is yes, they will one day. They will fit one day. We can't see it then, but we find out later on that we will fit into those adult shoes. And so it's the same with looking at how high the calling is in Jesus Christ. Christians may not look like a holy nation. They may not seem like a holy people. We certainly don't act like it. I know that I have fallen short. But remember, the Lord says that the Christian is a living stone, a living stone that is growing up into salvation. 
The Christian is a building that God is building. So don't look at how much you don't fit in those shoes. Now instead look ahead to the one whose shoes you will fit one day. Look ahead, not behind. And with this in mind, we see that in Christ we have a standard to live up to. You may not feel like a holy nation or a royal priesthood, but God has called you that. And in this royal priesthood, there are some difficult things to do. And they go against, counter, to what our natural nature, our human nature, our selfishness would say. We are to submit. Submit. This is a very difficult subject because it conjures up so many thoughts in our minds. Well, what about if they did this? And what about if they did that? Or what if this and that? And it's a difficult topic. The word submit, you can't get around it. It's exactly what it means. It's exactly what it means. It means bring yourself under authority and obey. Obey. I'm sorry, it does. That's what it means. Upo tasso in the Greek. Tasso means to come under the authority. Upo means to come underneath the authority. So you're supposed to obey. That's what it's saying. It's exactly correct. Submit. So how are we under authority? It says, but yet free in Christ. How does that work? You are set free from sin. You are set free to be the Lord's people. You are set free to grow and become this holy nation. And this holy nation does not include selfishness. It doesn't. Self-centeredness. It doesn't include that. Those are not the qualities that God wants. He wants you to learn how to bring yourself under authority. Moses is described as the meekest man who ever lived. He wasn't weak, but he brought himself under control. It's like a bridled horse, a, a horse that is broken and is able to work. You need to learn this. This is what the call of being a Christian includes. It's at the heart of Christ. Submit to all man-made authority. You do this because you are already learning now to submit to God's authority. Having come to know the living God, you understand that you have bowed your knees to Christ. And now the scripture is saying also to submit to government. In verse 17, though, I want to be clear about this. What I see here is a very important statement. Verse 17, if you look there, fear God and honor the king. Why does it say, fear God and honor the king? I understand it this way. Our reverence for God eclipses any honor we have for the king. Absolutely, completely eclipses it. We respect the king. It is right, it's honorable to do this. And our submission to the king is because we respect the Lord and we know it's the right thing to do. But our submission to the king is far, far below our submission to God. Fear God and honor the king. So submission to the king does not mean you do absolutely everything the government says. No. And the key here is the verse that says the intent of the government. Verse 14. The intent of the government is to reward those who do good and punish those who do evil. The assumption is that the government will be good in the eyes of the Lord. The assumption is that the government will be good in the eyes of the Lord. God does not intend for us to use these verses to follow any laws that disobey God's laws. What God has said is absolutely paramount. And you must never use these verses to say you obey the government to do evil. Ever. Laws for speeding should be observed, but laws allowing abortion should not be observed. Laws against being violent or assaulting someone, they should be observed. But laws taking away your freedom of speech are not to be observed. You must understand the laws of God, His Word, is paramount. We obey the laws of the land because this is where we live. But they cannot interfere in any way with God's laws. And we do this to bring glory to God, being honorable people. 
as much as we can, we submit to the government, we submit to the institutions that are here with a good heart. But not everywhere in Scripture do you see Christians or believers or Israel doing this, that they always submitted to the government. Well, there's many examples. You may have heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yes, they are more than just a Veggie Tales uh, story. It's a great picture of believers of Christ in Christ in this world. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego arrived in Babylon captivity, they were told to eat choice foods of Babylon. They were told you must. But they would not do this. They disobeyed. Why? They didn't do this because they wanted to protest themselves. They wanted to remind themselves that they weren't in Jerusalem and Israel any longer. They didn't want to enjoy the fruits of Babylon. We don't want to just go along with everything. They said, no, we're not going to do this. It reminded them that they were far from home. And the man said, you're going to get me killed if you don't eat this food. They said, trust me. We don't want to do this. And if it doesn't work out, we'll change. If we start to look pale or such, we'll change. We don't want you to get in danger. But you see, we're living differently. We're supposed to be living differently. And it will come contrary to what we find in this world. Remember, Daniel was told not to pray. Told he couldn't pray. And it was his custom to pray three times a day. Not only did he pray, but he continued to pray on his balcony. They could all see him. You see, you don't stop when the government says, stop doing something that's good for the Lord. You don't stop. This is a kingdom that's passing away. All of the kingdoms of this world are passing away. There is a coming kingdom that will last forever. And that is our true citizenship. Yes, we are Canadian citizens. But first and foremost, we must follow what the Lord says. As this country becomes more and more godless, we do not follow along and become more godless with it. No, we don't. In fact, we are to be the salt and light here. We are to be the ones that are taking a stand. This is important. We hold a line. There are lines we don't cross. So submit to the government, fear God, and honor the king. Main point number three, submit to those who are over you in your workplace or at church. 1 Peter 2.18 says, Servants, submit to your masters with all respect. Freedom in Christ is not to do everything we want, but to do everything the Lord wants. Remember the Lord's prayer, your will be done. Your will be done. We need to pray that and mean it. If you can, then you must know you are called to be servant. If you can say that prayer, you know you are called to be a servant. Your will be done. Look at verse 21. To this you have been called. You are called to be a servant. And our example is none other than Jesus Christ. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of glory. He made himself lower than the lowest servant. And he was obedient even to death on the cross. He was obedient even to death on the cross. And verse 21 says we are to follow in his footsteps. Follow in his footsteps. Well, if you follow the footsteps of Christ, where does it lead? If you follow the footsteps of Christ, where does it lead? It leads to the cross. We need to understand this. You could never take up the cross of our Lord. That's too great. That's too great. We pick up our own cross, it says. Jesus said it this way. That's why he said it this way. Take up your cross. Take up your cross. And follow me. It's your cross you take up. This means denying yourself. This means learning to submit to those in authority over you, to have a heart to be willing to submit to follow and obey. If you have trouble submitting to authority, just to any authority, 
You need to question yourself when you're following Christ who submitted himself even to death. And so it says we submit to our masters. Submit to your masters. Now there's two words for servant here, but this one is not the usual one. It's oikete. Oikos means house. It means a house servant. So what this is, is talking to servants, but not just to slaves. It's saying anyone who serves in any regard. The house servants, I'm not sure if you know, but Rome had this client service type relationship. That's how, that's how the, they worked their society. And so everyone was being, was, uh, was working for a client, a main client, and they, they had all their stuff. So this is the idea of exactly what we have today. We have worker, employee, employer relationships. Whenever you submit to authority that exists, you're doing it out of reverence for Christ. Notice the Bible says in verse 18, not only to good masters, which could say your boss, manager, but also to unjust ones as well. Meaning if they don't treat you fairly. Meaning if they ask too much of you. Meaning if they ask for blood, sweat, and tears every single day, and you're thinking, I haven't got blood, sweat, and tears every single day. Meaning if they, they're abusive towards you. You still submit to them. You submit to them out of reverence for Christ. You see, the world that we're in is not the kingdom of God. It's not. The Lord knows this. He knows where you are. He knows that Christians will find themselves working in some pretty nasty situations. But just like everyone else in this world, we have to learn to live with that. But we live with it with this different heart. Right? The Christian's reaction should be different towards a bad boss. It's not hard to grumble and gripe when a boss mistreats you. In fact, I would say, that's what everybody does. Right? The one who has a servant's heart, like Jesus did, will take the hurt of unjust treatment and suffer through it and show the love of God and the character of Christ instead of retaliating. Instead of retaliating. This is what the text is telling you. If you're reading this text and you're taking it to heart, he did not revile when he was reviled. He did not. He was silent, it says. And this was on purpose. You're submitting to God in the midst of this troubling situation, and it brings glory to God. So you might ask, how do I submit to a boss who's acting like this? How do I? Well, I can tell you I've had a couple of bad bosses in my life. I would say you do it like this. When your boss is standing before you and barking at you or cutting you down, you know that the Lord is standing behind you. You submit through your boss to the Lord standing behind you and say, yes, sir. For the Lord's sake, you do it. You're submitting to him for the Lord's sake. You're taking unfair treatment for Christ's sake, because he is the one you're following, the one who took the most unjust treatment you can imagine, for your sake. Jesus was reviled and slandered. He did not retaliate. Jesus entrusted himself into the hands of the Father. And this applies to the church as well. You see, we're called to submit. That's what we're called to do. We're called to become as people that are not wimpy, but willing to obey, willing to use our strength under control and follow what we're told, follow what God says. Will you submit? Only you can answer this question. Only you can, can say whether you will or you won't. I want you to know this. Being proud and rebellious is not a mark of Christian. It's not. It's not being... It's not, it's not a mark of Christian. Standing against evil in this world, it's a different story. But just being rebellious because you just don't want to do what somebody's telling you to do, that's not good in God's eyes. No. In fact, the Bible says that rebellion is just like the sin of witchcraft. I don't know if you know that. It is. Because witchcraft is rebellion against God's authority and power. 
So your rebelliousness, just because you don't want to, is a bad thing. Submission. Very difficult. Tall order. A tall calling. But that's how we have to see and be encouraged by our example in Christ, which is what the text says here as well. Main point number four. Christ submitted himself for our sake. And in 1 Peter 2, it says, He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He suffered unjustly for us. The reason that Jesus died on the cross is not simply an example. But that's part of it. Scripture tells us that he died for our sins. There is an atonement happening. There is a substitutionary atonement. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. However, Jesus going to the cross for our sake is also meant as an ultimate example. There is no higher example of submission and suffering. There is no higher example. Jesus said, greater love is no one than this to lay down his life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus' mind, his mind, was set on becoming a servant. It was set on becoming a servant. Philippians 2, he was the Lord of glory, the King of kings, and yet he brought himself down. He brought himself so far down not just to earth, but to become a little baby in, in a manger, in a feed trough, a king of kings in a feed trough. And then from there, he had no home, he said. And he went to the cross. He gave up everything for you. This is the example. There is no other example in history. All the other examples of anyone who was some sort of guru or great leader or something or humanitarian. We fall utterly, utterly short of this. And Jesus shows us this as he washes the disciples' feet. Excuse me. As he washes the disciples' feet. John 13, 14. He said, If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. By getting down and washing the disciples' feet, he was sending us a message. The King of Kings was showing them that there is no position so low that you should feel too proud to take it. There is no position too low that you should feel too proud to take it. The sin of pride will stop you. The sin of pride in your heart will stop you. It lurks in the background. It hides. It waits for the opportunity to say, you're better than that. That's too, that's beneath you. They should, they should show you more. They, they should treat you better. Really? They should have treated Jesus better, shouldn't they? Pride is easily offended. Pride is quick to shout for its rights. You can't do that to me. How dare you? Oh, I know I'm guilty of it. Lord, forgive me. Jesus is showing us an example of a better world to come. There is coming another world which has got nothing to do with pride. This passage about Jesus as our example of humility and of serving others and of his sacrifice is so important that in 1 Peter it's repeated. It might seem at first like, why is it these things being said twice? 1 Peter 2.20 is very similar to 1 Peter 3.17. They have the same statements. But God doesn't repeat things because he made a mistake. He repeats them because they're so important. This is a central part of the book of 1 Peter. Submission and suffering unjustly for his name. And we see here it is repeated twice. It is better to suffer for doing good. First Peter 3.17, if that be God's will. And in 1 Peter 2.20, it says you are to endure suffering. It is the will of God for you to do this. It's a gracious thing for you to endure suffering. Unjustly. Unjustly. These are difficult words. This is a difficult passage. 
this is moving further and further into this higher calling. The will of God is that you would suffer unjustly, that you would suffer for his name. You'd be willing to take his name upon yourself. It's difficult, but it is a high, high calling. Are we willing to do this? This sec central section is talking about submission. It's talking about the Lord submitting first to him, and then to government, and to authority, and to employers, and in all relationships in life. There's levels of submitting. God is a God of authority and structure, and this is what he has ordained. And wrapped around this whole, this command to submit to authority is the example of Jesus Christ in the middle of it all. Why is he saying this? Because of the importance of this to your life as a Christian. So my question to you then, as I bring the gospel to you, who is on the throne of your life? Who is on the throne of your life? Is it you? Or is it Christ? Salvation includes confessing that Jesus is Lord. That's what it says. It is easy to call him Savior. I don't mean to belittle. I don't want to be harsh toward you. But scripture says in Romans 10, 9 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That's what it says. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess him as Lord. Is he Lord? You believe that Jesus is Lord and you submit to him as Lord. That's what it's asking. And that's what the Christians died for. The martyrs died horrible, gruesome deaths because they wouldn't call Caesar Lord. And by that, it wasn't just saying that he was the governor or the king. That meant that Caesar was God. They wouldn't do that. In fact, did you know that all they had to do was take a little pinch of incense and throw it into a flame and, and just, just say, Caesar's Lord. And they could have escaped free. They could have escaped free. And there's dozens and dozens of Roman documents that show what happened. It shows that Roman governors would plead with these Christians. Just do the simple thing. What is, what is your obstinance? Don't you love Rome? I do. I care about this place, but I'm not going to call Caesar Lord. And so the governor said, okay, put them to the sword. He took them in another room and he killed them. Because they refused to call Caesar Lord. You have to understand this. Only one is Lord and God of all. And you serve him. Confessing Jesus is Lord is what we're looking for here. I ask again, who is on the throne of your life? Is it Christ or is it you? If you have never turned to Jesus in your life, then you are not forgiven for your sins. You're not. Turn to him today. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for you. He did this because God so loves you. He loves the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. He bore your sins and mine on that tree, it says. If you repent of your sins and believe in him, as Lord and Savior, you will have forgiveness and eternal life, and you will be bound for an everlasting kingdom. So this central section is really hard, and I'm sorry if this has been offensive to you. I really am. Because... The Lord loves you. He loves you with his steadfast love. But it's his will to make you more than what you might even imagine you're going to be. He wants you to become a servant. He wants our pride to go to the cross. And this new life in Christ should be of humility. It's so important to God that he repeated it twice in the book of Peter. Are we willing to take up our cross? Are we willing to become a servant? Maybe our comfortable lives, myself included, have made us forget. We are called to endure hardship while doing good. 
we're called to that. Maybe we've forgotten that it's actually God's will that we sometimes be reviled and spoken badly of and brings glory to the Lord. You're called to be a servant, and you may have to suffer unjustly sometimes. Yes, there'll be times of joy and refreshing. There'll be good things in your life, but the test will be whether you accept these things that come into your life. Will you accept them? When that moment comes, will you take that reviling? Will you see that you are supposed to submit and with a good heart take that? Don't look for the easy way out. No, follow the footsteps of Christ. Don't look for the easy way out. Follow the footsteps of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Please stand if you're able and join us in singing Victory in Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. You can tell Dennis uh, we lost control of the device. Um, so, um, why don't you read this passage to you? You know, it's a servant's heart that we're looking for. This is something that the Lord will give you. And I pray that we would have a servant's heart. There's a blessing in it. <coughs> Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. Have this mind upon yourself, which is in Christ. <laughs> Though he was in the very form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. May we go forward remembering it's a servant's heart. To learn.